I'm Dallas Jenkins, I'm the director of The Chosen, and I am sitting in the middle of the beginning of a joke, right? A Catholic, a Jew, and an evangelical walk into a bar who actually walks out first because they're offended that they're even near a bar. Uh, but this feels like that, but uh, we have a really great opportunity. Uh, I am talking to our three biblical consultants on The Chosen. Uh, when we decided to do this show, uh, one of the things we really wanted to make sure we were doing was be as close to scripture as humanly possible while still making a show. You know, there have been shows, uh, miniseries, movies that have been made about the life of Christ that literally take a verse by verse account and they've been done well. And there's been some of those movies that have, that have uh, reached the globe where they're literally just narrating scripture and the actors are acting it out. And so we're going a little further. We're going into backstory of some of these characters. We're doing what's a combination of historical context, biblical context, and a little artistic imagination. And now that's treading on very dangerous waters. There's a lot of agreement on the stories of Jesus, not a lot of agreement all the time on how to interpret all of them. But we really wanted to show respect to the, the three traditions represented at this table. I'm an evangelical, but uh, now I'm going to introduce well, who we're talking to. So this is Father David Guffey, and uh, we've got Rabbi Jason Sobel and Dr. Doug Huffman. And uh, so you guys all are uh, traditional Bible scholars and believers. We all believe the Bible is the Word of God. Uh, but obviously there's different shades uh, and different personalities that come from this. And so one of the things I wanted to do, uh, now that we've seen episode one, uh, you guys consulted for us when we wrote the scripts. Um, I sent you all four scripts, and I was saying, what, am I, what do I got right, what do I got wrong? And then I'd get these pages back with big blocks of red ink all over them, <laughs> saying this is what we got wrong. But there were still some things that I think were, that reflected a little bit of a difference of opinion on whether it's scripture or interpretation. So all that to say, that's the long introduction. Episode one, we introduce all of our main characters. Uh, we are getting into the backstory of some of these characters. Jesus doesn't even show up until the very end. So I'm gonna start with you, Father Guffey. What stood out to you uh, as something that you thought that's either more closely Catholic, for lack of a better term, uh, than what I normally see in Jesus projects, or that's less Catholic than if it would have been made by someone other than an evangelical? One of the ways that Catholics pray with Scripture, and this came from St. Saint, Saint Ignatius of Loyola, is to read Scripture and read it a couple of times and then to engage it with imagination and to uh, really sit in med a meditative state and put, try to put yourself in the scene uh, so that you can imagine the characters and the Ignatian style of meditation would invite one to listen, imagine what you'd, what you'd hear, what you'd taste, what you'd smell, what you'd touch. And this seemed almost like that kind of a meditation on scripture and looking at the world that people would be in. When you do that kind of meditation, you have to do it with some humility that you're not actually having a vision Right. because there's interpretation going on and we obviously bring a 21st century mindset and references to it. And I thought the series did some of the same. It's in English that's right. easily accessible today with patterns of speech that are probably closer to today, but that is an imagining of, what, of who these people might have been and what their world would have been like. The other thing that I found fascinating is Mary Magdalene is such an interesting character. Right. And before the 1600s, Mary Magdalene was featured prominently in, in art in European cathedrals. Um, that changed somewhat with the Reformation for a lot of different reasons. But she was really a powerful figure in the imagination of, of Catholics for about 600 years. Lots of images of her. And I thought of there's a window at the cathedral at Chartres um, that's a Mary Magdalene window that essentially imagines the story of Mary Magdalene hmm. and the way that the episode one does, kind of going through the life of Mary Magdalene. So uh, I, I, when, I, when I read the script and, um, and became aware of episode one, I, I immediately thought of that window and I thought, oh, they're doing what they did in the 1200s when they right. built the cathedral at Chartres. Yeah. So you use the term imagination and that's something that I think evangelicals traditionally are almost scared of. Hmm. Uh, if you look at art throughout the years, uh, almost all of the great art that's faith-based has come from Catholics. Evangelicals tend to be distrusting of imagery. Uh, we sometimes confuse it with idolatry. Um, I have been with evangelicals where we've walked into some of the most beautiful basilicas in the world. And I, as an artist, have been like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. And I've had other evangelical friends say, this, is, this feels wrong. Mm. This feels too much of an attempt to try to be beautiful. 
but there's nothing beautiful in the world. It's all evil. It's all sinful. I mean, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but but imagination is something that evangelicals sometimes are are scared of almost. It's like, no, we got to stick to the words. The words are what matter. And I really love what you just said about uh, this idea of when you're meditating on it, that you're imagining how it could have felt. And I think that's something that we really strive to do in this series is when I want people to feel taste, smell, I want it, you know, feel the dust. I want it to, I want it to feel like what it must have been like back then to a point. Obviously there's, there's limits, but I think that's one of the biggest differences between Catholics and evangelicals, at least when it comes to art, is you're much more imaginative and we're scared of that. We're like, well, if we imagine too much, then we're relying on our own human brain and we can't trust that. So we just need to stick to the text and that's it. So um, Rabbi Jason, I went to Israel with you last year where we visited some of the sites. It was my first time. Um, and you did an amazing job of giving me some of the historical and biblical context to this. But was there anything about episode one in particular that you, that you thought, that's a little bit more Jewish friendly than some uh, traditional uh, Jesus projects? Yeah, there? absolutely. I mean, I think it's overall about the series. It's something that I really appreciate. I mean, obviously there's been, uh, we tend to want to make Jesus in our own image and likeliness, right? right? And so historically there's been a lot of blonde haired, blue eyed, kind of <laughs> Western, uh, westernized Jesuses and disciples. Right. And I love the fact that there's a very ethnic feel to the disciples and there's, they have accents and it's, it's, you know, when you look at their complexion or you look up, you look at it uh, Peter is actually played by an Israeli. Right. So, I mean, I love that component right. of looking at the characters in the story, which I think is great. And I love just even trying to capture some of the authenticity of the Jewish culture, which in further episodes, uh, get into, right. which right. I really appreciate yeah. and value about it. And I also just love in general the fact that uh, really so many series about the life of, of Jesus focus on Jesus. Right. And I love the fact that this focus on uh, people's encounters with him right. and how their lives are changed and transformed as a result of it. And I think that's so significant because I often think we get this Ah, divine Jesus, <laughs> but you know, he, he, there's a humanity right. to him. And part of that humanity is he's the son of David and there's a Jewishness in that humanity, which I love. Now, before I get to Dr. Huffman, I'm gonna do a quick commercial break and give you some appreciation for the fact that you're even calling him Jesus. Right. Because I know <laughs> that you guys don't call him Jesus. You refer right. to him as Yeshua. And so you're you're, uh, you're, as Paul said, being all things to all men or whatever it's, as you're sitting at this table. I, I, want, I want us to talk about that just for a minute of why it's either okay or not okay to, did what we, to do what we did. My interpretation is, and we said this at the beginning of the episode, we gave this disclaimer that talked about, uh, we use the term English transliteration, which means that these characters all spoke English. The English language did not exist back then. Uh, there are certain letters that did not exist. Uh, from what I understand, the, the letter J, the J sound is not a Hebrew sound, correct? No. Yeah, so, but my, my thought was, listen, we can either go all the way and just have, have them speak Hebrew, or we can go all the way in here and have them speak English and just recognize that this is essentially an impression or a tr like even some of the phrases they use um, uh, aren't, weren't necessarily invented until you know later centuries, but we're saying, they might have not have had the phrase sticking up for the little guy back 2,000 years ago, but they had a phrase like that. And so we're gonna interpret, kind of put it into a more modern context. But I know that it couldn't have been natural for you sure. uh, to, 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 to call him Jesus and to see him called Jesus. Uh, is it okay? Are, are we forgiven? Because uh, my thought is, if we call him Yeshua, then all the other character names have to be changed too. And I just thought, let's just go with the English and uh, in different uh, cultures, uh, it'll be subtitled. But uh, can I? Maybe I'm asking for forgiveness or permission. <laughs> how, how bad is it? Yeah. I'm, I'm, look, on the on the one, I mean, I like that overall. You're trying to bring the authenticity to of the Jewishness of the culture, which is already a significant a step in the right direction right. So you'll that take we you don't can see <laughs> in other things. Uh, I mean, obviously, his name was Yeshua, which mm -hmm. is a shortened form of Joshua. And uh, there's significance to why that was right. his name. But we also have to understand that uh, the, New, the New Testament primarily comes down to us in the language of Greek, because it was a common language, or it might have been uh, Hebrew, Hebrew Gospel of Matthew, according to some of the mm -hmm. early church history. But it does come down to us Greek, because that was the common language of the day, and the message was 
for the message. And so I, th I think that since this is a message for the masses, a show to the masses, I think, you know, it, it, it does that for that reason. Well, what I've been said to people is, um, you know, Jesus is the, and correct me if I'm wrong, the English transliteration of the Greek, right? Is that about right? That's of, about uh, right. Like, um, not the translation, transliteration. The, the Greek literally transliterated the letters and it came to Yesus or something like a... Yeah, uh, Yesus, because yes. there's no J in Greek. Right, right. Yeah. yeah. So, um, what I've said to people though is it's, uh, you know, it's same man, same meaning, same Messiah. So, Dr. Hoffman, yes. as you know, in the evangelical world, uh, we're very focused on the words and the literalness of Scripture. Uh, we tend to err on the side of, of the literary and the literal. And I've heard from people who, uh, when they hear about the show, say, well, Revelation says to not add to Scripture. And so we are uncomfortable with the fact that you are adding to Scripture. And, and Father Duffy may be okay with imagination, but there's no need for it because you have the Bible, and I'm just going to stick to the Bible. Why is it okay, if it is, uh, to ignore what John said in the book of Revelation <laughs> and add to some of these stories with some backstory. Well, you're certainly not attempting to add another book to the Bible. 100% uh, correct. Yeah, and the, the people who uh, only want to read the Bible won't be watching this series. Right. So, so th you don't have to worry about those kind of, kind of complaints. Right. Um, yeah, I actually think that uh, evangelicals' desire to honor the Word of God um, is it's got pluses and minuses. Um, the strength, of course, is they're trying to avoid errors that we've seen happen in church history where things do get added to Scripture, where doctrines are added to Scripture that actually distracts from the truth that God gave us in written form. Unfortunately, the pendulum swings to the point where now they're almost worshiping the Bible mm. instead of the God who gave them the Bible. Interesting. And so uh, bringing us back to being whole people, including a God-given imagination, I, th I think this is a, a, an important thing for us to be doing, even as we read Scripture, but having our imaginations controlled by Scripture, which, as you've said, uh, you're trying to do that with this series. Um, so I, I think what happens with evangelical readings of Scripture is it all becomes flat, and there's... There's no um, relatability to these characters in the Bible because they're just these words on the page. And, oh, of course we know that story. Here's how it goes. Right. But there's, I have nothing in common because I live a three-dimensional life, not black and white letters on a page. Right. So what a film series like this does for us is it reignites our imagination and helps us relate to what's written on the page. Um, recognizing that, yeah, our imaginations need to be controlled by the page, right. but still, wow, this, Mary is a real person. <laughs> right. uh, she had real problems, kind of like my problems. Right. Um, yeah, that draws people in, and uh, maybe they'll start reading their Bibles more. Right. Well, we've heard that from believers. I mean, I've done a few test screenings, and someone said, you know, I, like a lifelong believer, I've heard this from many of them, have said, this made me want to go back and read my Bible. And, and kind of figure out even more. And, and then when they read it, they said it, it was even more enriched because I, I, when I saw Matthew's name in Scripture, I started to identify with him or, and, and, and realize that, oh yeah, he, like you said, he was human. He had a, uh, one, one quick thing I wanna, I wanna say before I, I bridge to a question I have for you, Rabbi Jason, is uh, in episode one, we see Simon go home to his wife and they kiss and they tease each other and they have this conversation. While I was shooting that scene, I thought to myself, I've never seen a married couple kiss in a Bible show before. And then I realized I've never seen a married couple in a Bible <laughs> show before. Um, and where did I draw when I was writing that scene? You know, what did I draw from? So there's biblical context from what we can see about Simon's personality. Okay, we know nothing about his wife's personality. So gleaning from that and gleaning from my own life as a, as a married man, I know what marriage life is like for many people. That informed us as much as the biblical context and the historical context. But that leads me to a question. So these are some of these characters. Almost everything that's in this episode consists of things that aren't outlined in Scripture. But we tried to make them plausible. And so the big thing that stands out in episode one that you and I have talked about several times that you, that you, you hesitantly gave me permission for 
is Simon fishing on Shabbat? Now, let me first of all clarify and ask this question. Is there a difference between Shabbat and Sabbath? We always use the term Sabbath, and Shabbat is a relatively unique term to, to those of us who aren't Jewish. Yeah, Shabbat is the Hebrew term for the Sabbath. So right. Shabbat is what, like in the Ten Commandments, this is you're talking about honoring and keeping the right. Shabbat, which is the Sabbath. So right. it's the transliteration of the Hebrew right. term. Obviously, there's some difference of what day is the Shabbat between the Jewish and Christian traditions. So the biblical Sabbath of the Ten Commandments is Friday night to Saturday night, because uh, it says evening and morning the first day. In Christian tradition, it gets uh, becomes Sunday. Right. But Sabbath, you know, biblically, what we're talking about is Shabbat. Right. What does Shabbat Shalom mean for those uh, who don't know? Yeah, it's Shabbat Shalom is your tra traditional Jewish greeting that you're wishing the Sabbath peace uh, to someone. So it's the traditional greeting on the Sabbath. So in the first draft of the script, I really wanted to show all of these characters as struggling in some way. Good drama has a character arc. And someone goes from ideally a negative to a positive. And the, the, the farther you go, the, the sharper the arc, the better for drama's purposes. And now we're, of course, trying to do a multi-season series, which is going to last six, seven years. And so the arc needs to be pretty long. So I really wanted to establish these characters as having significant struggles and doing things out of desperation, perhaps, especially with the Roman occupation at the time, the poverty at the time. So I kind of casually wrote in, uh, my, my partners and I, that Simon broke a, a, a commandment or a, a, a Jewish tradition by, by uh, fishing on Shabbat. And uh, you said, no way, no how, <laughs> wouldn't happen. So I said, well, what if we made it, because I didn't even treat it like it was a big deal. And you said, no, this would be a huge deal <laughs> to the point where I don't even believe it would have ever happened. So I said, how can I meet you halfway? So we, we made it so that he was doing it out of desperation. He was justifying it by saying, if a life is at stake, Koch I could do it. I said, right. at least mm -hmm. right. make an argument that right. there's a, out of desperation, out of the need to save a life. There is the, like a doctor, for example, can break the Sabbath in order right. to save a life. There's certain instances right. that transcend the actual keeping of the, the letter of the and Shabbat. And then when his brother Andrew finds out that he wants to fish on Shabbat, when his wife Eden, she doesn't know yet in episode one, we get into that in future episodes, but the notion, like he has to hide it when he comes home. He's kind of pretending, like he doesn't say whether he did fish on Shabbat or not. And she, you know, uh, so uh, I tried to treat it like it would be a big deal if he did it. You would say it just wouldn't, it, it wouldn't happen even if it was treated like Yeah, no, deal. I don't think he would have violated, violated the Shabbat. I mean, I even think that we see in the Gospel of, of Matthew when we first in, introduced to John uh, the Baptist, actually, he's John the Mikvah man, the immerser. But uh, we see Peter and his brother, they're already, they're already searching. They're already mm -hmm. part of this uh, teshuva movement. This re they're, they're looking to return to God and connect. And, so, uh, and, and obviously breaking the Shabbat is punishable biblically by death. I mean, people were never really put to death right. in biblical times for violating the Shabbat. But that's how serious and grave the issue is. Shabbat was at the core and it still is at the core of all right. Jewish identity and observance to this day. And he was an uh, observant... Jew. Right. So we got we got to the point where you were tolerable of it because of the fact that we treated it like it was a big deal and that he had to come up with pretty serious justification to even to even consider it. And I think that's yeah that he wouldn't have certainly wouldn't have just treated it casually. Right. It would have been a it wouldn't be something like oh I just broke the Shabbat you know like right. and that's very different in the Christian mindset because the Shabbat doesn't have that level for most right. Christians today of significance, maybe more akin to like the movie of Chariots of Fire, right. where we don't play soccer on the <laughs> Sabbath day, right? It, it's, but even more so. Right. Right. Uh, but one of the things that I recognize about The Chosen, which I appreciate coming back to kind of both of your comments, which is that there's in the Jewish interpretive tradition, there's something known as midrash. It comes from the word drash, which means to search out or to seek out. And the rabbis like to ask questions and they don't like unanswered questions. Right. And so when they look at the text, they do get creative with the text and they want to know why such and such happens in the text. And uh, they, they search for reasons and they tend to add background mm -hmm. to the story for that reason. And so I'd say really what you're doing is very Jewish in a sense. It's kind of a Christian midrash right. on the story, on the text, right? So. Oh, that's, yeah, that's well said. Um, because I really wanted to establish, uh, you know, we'll, by the time we get to episode four, which I, I don't want to give away too much, obviously, um, but... Um, by the time Jesus comes into Simon's life and, you know, the miracle of the fish is where we're headed. Where, and I wanted that to be 
uh, not only a spiritual moment, but a, but a, a rescue of sorts. Now, how accurate was is the show in capturing the Roman, the socio-political uh, times? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you that question. To just um, you know, the Roman occupation, the, the the different factions among the Pharisees and Sadducees. It was there was a lot of political, socio-political unrest. Correct. There was a lot of tension. They were an occupying army, and the Romans kept power. Uh, they'd give some power to a petty king like Herod or uh, a procurator. And then they, they had their own procurators that would, would be there. But uh, the, Ro the, the Roman piece, the Pax Romana, was really a piece of, of a heavy hand. And they were quick to squash rebel movements because they couldn't afford it. They needed trade routes opened. And I think we forget that. Um, like in the story of the centurion um, who came to Jesus and asked that his servant be healed, that would have been a big deal um, because Jesus was doing a favor for an occupying military person, an oppressor essentially. Right. So, and you capture that in the first episode. Yeah, we wanted to establish right off the bat that, uh, yeah, like you said, the Romans had a heavy hand and the taxation at that time was immense, right? I mean, it was to the point where um, you know, that's why we kind of created this scenario that's not uh, outlined in scripture, but it's plausible because I know we, we went to Capernaum and it was plausible, maybe not likely, but plausible that Matthew could have been Simon and Andrew's tax collector, right? And so knowing that the taxation was that heavy, that's what we were trying to portray is this desperation, mm -hmm. that the Messiah arrived in a moment of total desperation and total uh, oppression. So on that note, dangerous question perhaps, perhaps based on some of my ignorance of the Catholic tradition, St. Peter. So in the evangelical tradition, we're very skeptical or nervous about calling anyone a saint uh, because, you know, again, we're, you know, we're, we're all evil sinners and we're incapable of doing anything good. Um, and Catholics are a little bit more willing to, oh, you're able to do some good sometimes. Uh, St. Peter, uh, how, uh, you know, is, uh, are we violating a sacred cow by showing St. Peter doing some of the things that he does in this episode, Andrew, some of these struggles that people have? How protective are uh, Catholics? And I know, uh, I don't want to paint you all with a broad brush, but how protective are you of your saints? Well, that's a really a great question. Uh, the, the, the portrait you give of Peter is not one that will be comfortable for some Catholics, mm -hmm. but I don't think it's, it would be considered heresy, and I, but I think it will be stretching. Right. The, the good part of that is, is I think people need to remember that Peter was human, right. and you get a sense of Peter's impetuousness and other things, so it, that it could be plausible. Um, the, the story that's laid out could be plausible, but one of the one of the problems of Catholic notions of saints is that when when someone is recognized formally as a saint, sometimes their humanness is sanitized out. Mm -hmm. So um, they you forget that this was a person who had a faith journey, who had conversion points in their life. They may have been very. They may not have been a dramatic dramatic single one, but a number of points in their life where they made real decisions, or they had to recover from mistakes, or where they, were, they struggled, and that gets lost. There was a famous laywoman named Dorothy Day who was this incredible servant of the poor in the 1930s. She founded this movement that created a homes for, a houses for the homeless around the United States. And people, when she was alive, used to say, you're, you're a saint, and she'd say, don't dismiss me that easily. Um, <laughs> just because and when, he, when he called her a saint, the radicalness of, she was uh, nonviolence, and she was a pacifist, mm -hmm. and kind of radical giving of one's wealth to the poor. So I think it, I think it, it won't be a comfortable right. um, portrait for a lot of Catholics, mm -hmm. but I, I think it could be helpful in the long run. Yeah. So Mary Magdalene is, is the most featured character in episode one. We want it, I mean, episode one of any show is essentially a setup episode. You're, you're introducing the characters, you're introducing the settings. Uh, there's not necessarily a beginning, a middle, and an end uh, that hopefully comes at the end of the season. But we definitely knew that if we wanted people to watch this show, we needed to give them something at the end of episode one that get, made them think, okay, this isn't just a bunch of sadness and oppression the whole time. We do get to see some victory. And so we wanted to show uh, a character experience some sort of of redemption or victory, and, and Mary Magdalene was who we chose. And so we created this backstory of, of trauma in her childhood. So Dr. Hoffman, I'll start with you on Mary Magdalene. Uh, what are the biggest misconceptions about Mary Magdalene? Uh, I, I can think of two off the top of my head, um, uh, but what would you say are some of the biggest misconceptions uh, in, in, in traditions about Mary Magdalene? Yeah, this, uh, this is one of those issues where 
evangelicals become afraid of imagination because Mary Magdalene's um, uh, traditions about her have gone far afield of what Scripture actually says about her. Uh, she's been likened to a prostitute. She's been even identified as the woman in John chapter 8 caught in, a, in the act of adultery. And, uh, but the text doesn't say that at all. But this over-imaginations have kind of overshadowed what the Bible says about her. And so I appreciate the uh, corrective imagination you're using in episode one, that Mary is a troubled person. The Bible does say she was oppressed by demons uh, and that Jesus rescued her from those. Um, so your dramatic portrayal of her, I think, gives some reality to Bible readers. Oh, this is plausible. This, this does fit what the Bible tells us about her. And now I can relate to her as a real person with trouble. Right. And she she has a background that, right. it's, that her trouble is not even her fault. Right. Well, I've got troubles that aren't my fault. Right. Um, and now she becomes a relatable character instead of just this person who I have these known imaginations that I have to dismiss, but I, I don't know anything else. Right. Now, because it says in Scripture, uh, when we're introduced to her, it almost speaks of it in past tense. Mary Magdalene, who had been possessed or oppressed by by demons, and so we work. We that was our beginning point, and then we worked our way backwards. And so what would, what would lead someone to be oppressed by demons? At some point, and this I know each tradition holds a little bit differently of what, what, what could allow you to be oppressed or, or possessed by demons. And so we thought uh, trauma would be, would be something that would cause someone, especially living in a, in a religious atmosphere, you wouldn't come easily to just all of a sudden be possessed by or oppressed by demons. And so we thought of this, this traumatic experience as a child, losing her father, uh, being abused, uh, potentially even sexually abused by a Roman in her teenage years. And we even have that scene. There's a moment in the, in the episode where she's flashing back and having this oppression to when this Roman uh, assaulted her. And there's a visual of, uh, as, he, as he gets over her, her, there's there's darkness that literally covers her face, and we were essentially metaphorically, and this is where I, some of the Catholic in me was coming out, metaphoric uh, imagery, um, showing darkness enveloping her, and we thought of that almost being the moment when demons uh, began their their oppression of her. Are there different interpretations in the different traditions about demonic possession versus oppression? Um, in the Catholic Church, it seems more common, right? To when I, you know, the, the movies about exorcism have tend to come from, from Catholic tradition. Um, what is the belief that, like, that when when it talks in Scripture about Mary Magdalene, um, what is the, for all intents and purposes, what was the belief about what took place? Was she possessed by demons? What 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 is that? What does that mean? Well, um, Scripture says she was possessed by demons. So, and that would be, there's a. Uh, belief that that, take, that that happens, it's fairly rare. Mm -hmm. Possession is when one loses one's free will and is completely controlled by another entity. Right. Um, oppression would be where demonic forces are trying to exert influence, but they aren't really controlling. Temptation is just where they're kind of pulling and beckoning. So there would be, it would be recognized that there are, there are different ways and different levels of the ways that the evil one could try to insert itself into one's life, always recognizing that the power of God is stronger than any force of evil. And, uh, but even those nuances are interpretive nuances. The, yeah. the, the New Testament doesn't have separate words. It just has one where it, this person was demonized. Hmm. It doesn't make a distinction between oppression and possession and temptation. Well, and, but you have examples of people talking about temptation, like Paul. Yeah, yeah we, we have those examples, yeah, but right. we, we don't have this technical terminology. Right. This person's oppressed, but this person's right. possessed. And, right. and I've heard too many people try to almost congratulate themselves, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm oppressed by a demon, but at least I'm not possessed. It's like, you know, if you've got a demon problem, you, it needs to be taken care of. Yeah, don't, don't congratulate yourself on that. And, so. and the answer to most demon problems is just talk to somebody, pray, start observing your religious practice. For Catholics, we'd say go to confession, start going to services, and then try to live a good life. Right. And then bring your life into, al into alignment with God. So, I mean, most of the time, if people do that, um, the problem if there is a demonic problem, it, 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 it lessens over time. If, and the other thing is, as you point out, 
the forces of evil will use trauma or will use other kinds of illness. And so it's really, it's critical in the, the like, in the Catholic tradition right now, if somebody feels that they're possessed, the first thing you do is you send them to a medical doctor and a psychologist right. to make sure that all other things are explored and looked at first. Because if you, if you can heal the body, um, then it, even if there is a, some presence of evil there, uh, if you can close that, close that crack or begin the healing, then the spiritual. Yeah, and the, it's interesting because in the Jewish tradition, uh, even in modern Hebrew, if you're sick, you go to the Beit Holim. And the word for sick comes from the word hol. It's actually mm -hmm. first used in Genesis, Hav Mavdil Ben Kodesh Lechol. He makes a separation between the holy and the, and the secular or the profane. And so the word hol come literally means to bore out. So the idea is that sickness is a result of there's a vacuum. There's mm -hmm. something missing where God should be. Right. Or there's, there, there's a lack of a wholeness, mm -hmm. and that lack of a wholeness, that, that boring out that space that is created allows opportunity for things that are not of God right. to come in, whether it's physical sickness, whether it's right. negative spiritual influences. And you see that even uh, in the Hebrew, the difference between redemption and exile, uh, geula and gola is one letter difference. It's a letter Aleph. So when you take out the letter Aleph, which represents God's name, you, you, you end up with exile. Mm -hmm. And if you put the Aleph back in, he's the Aleph and the Tal, <laughs> you get redemption. And so when, when God is taken out, there's something missing you end up with the opportunity, this vacuum, this space. It's the parable of, of Yeshua, of Jesus, where you clean the house and, and it's empty. And if, if it's not filled in with God, then it's space for something else to enter. And that's a very conceptually Jewish view going back to creation. Right. And that's something we were focusing on was we opined that the trauma of her childhood and of her, of her teenage years, like you, you said, it, it, it created a vacuum or it allowed her to be, to be taken by something else. And so the first words that Jesus speaks in our series are, that's not for you. So he, she's, she's literally reaching for drink to fill the void. In fact, the, the bartender, for lack of a better term, says, this is not meant to solve your problems. It's meant to distract from them. And she says, no, give it to me. I want, this. I want to give it to me. She goes to reach for it, and Jesus walks in. And the first time we see him, he says, that's not for you. And she rejects that, she, she, she starts to get, like the, the demons were portraying her as, as starting to really get worked up. Mm -hmm. And so she's getting a headache, it was just in, by the presence of Jesus. And she says, leave me alone. And that to me was very much an encompassing of how we uh, oftentimes, when Jesus is pursuing us, sometimes we're like, no, no, I don't want this. I want my thing. I'm possessed by something else. In her case, it's demons. But I think a lot of us can be owned by other things besides Christ. So she's walking out trying to get away and he calls her by name and the scripture that he speaks over her is when he says, you know, thus says the Lord who created you and he who formed you. And then he says, you are mine. And it's not just casting out a demon, which was what Nicodemus was trying to do. He's not only casting out a demon, he is taking ownership. Mm -hmm. And so when he says, you are mine and puts his hands on her head and then she kind of leans in and, and, and just becomes his, that was meant to be a, you know, a physical and, and literal representation of she is no longer possessed by anything else. She now belongs to Christ. But I love it because I think that, I think one of the principal biblical truths is that identity is destiny. Your destiny is wrapped up in your identity. And biblically, a person's identity is connected to their name. So oftentimes when God gives someone a new identity, Jacob to Israel, supplanter to one who wrestles with God to overcomes, Avram to Abraham, uh, he gives them a new name. And so, I, so you see that even with the change of her name right. in the story representing her new identity, her new destiny because of her encounter. And uh, I love it because the change of the name and portrays all that and saying, I know you by name because Hebrew name is Shem. And at the word, and at the heart of the root neshama, which means soul, the middle two letters is the word name, mm -hmm. because a person's name reveals their soul, mm -hmm. and who they're called to be, who they're created to be. Yeah, it's a very moving scene, and for all of these artistic nuances, uh, all woven together, into a place where I think the viewer can identify. I mean, sometimes we love our problems. We we right. want to get rid of them, but we're comfortable with them. At least I know this problem, and I've resigned myself to live with this problem. When Jesus comes to rescue her from her problem, she's not so sure she wants to give it up because it's what she knows, but he pursues her. 
And I think there's many viewers who will need to hear this message that, wow, maybe there's an answer to my problems. And maybe, maybe the discomfort I feel is I'm being pursued by my creator who maybe wants to change my life symbolized with the change okay. of the name. I, yeah, I thought it was very creatively uh, well done, very moving. And hopefully see the ways that Christ is pursuing them, um, right. maybe through a person, through a book, through a song that touches them, yeah. something that God's always yeah. trying to say to, to us, you are mine. I was curious about where you got her name Lilith. Uh, uh, if there's a meaning to that that, uh, that made that happen, or well, if it's just somebody that you hated in your childhood. No, no. or <laughs> Well, my, my writing partner, Tyler Thompson, uh, I have two writing partners, Ryan Swanson and Tyler Thompson. And Tyler, I would call a Catholical. Like he's kind of partly Catholic, <laughs> partly evangelical. I mean, he's an evangelical primarily. He's raised in that church, but he really likes like Anglican churches. He, he's comfortable in Catholic services. He likes the, the, the dramatic, the imagery, the, all that stuff. Um, and so uh, for him, he's the one who, who came up with the name Lilith. When we came up with this idea of her giving herself a different name, almost to try, almost in a way to deny her, her upbringing, who she truly was, I believe he knew the meaning of the name because you guys pointed out to me that Lilith, because you said, oh, I'm not sure if Lilith would be a good name for her because it means what? Well, I mean, it, it's associated with uh, negative characters within right. the tradition demonic going back to, right. yeah. So I didn't know that when, I, when he said I, he suggested Lilith and it was so accurate yeah. to what Very the name actually Lilith. means. That's why we stuck with it. Yeah. But, I th but I think it was, I think he knew, he's into meanings and, and names and stuff like that. And, and so it was just kind of, I think, meant to symbolize a little bit of the, of the darkness that, that she was facing. So There's also something interesting in her Hebrew name, because Mary in Hebrew is Miriam, right. and which is Miriam, which means bitter waters. Right? So there's a sense in which even the character herself, there's this bitterness right. within her life. And obviously that's Moses' sister, and she gets that name because they're in exile right. in Egypt and slavery. So there's an interesting connection even there. And Jesus comes and sweetens the waters right. in a sense of her life. I'd like to pretend that I did that on purpose. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to take credit for that. But that was in the text. So. Right. <laughs> so I'm going to close with this. Um, Jesus doesn't enter into this episode until the very end. And uh, he enters in a, what I think modern people would consider per perhaps a place of ill repute, which is essentially a 2,000-year-old version of a, of a bar. We evangelicals, uh, drinking at all is, is very uh, untraditional, very scary. I grew up, my mom, when I'd go to a baseball game, uh, like at Ridley Field or whatever, uh, the, 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 the guy would come with the beer and she would say, I don't pass beer. Like he was running to pass it down the aisle <laughs> to the person. Like she doesn't even touch it. My father has never had a sip. Now he doesn't find it sinful. He just, right. he's, he grew up with the belief that it was sinful and so he hasn't had a drop. Um, but the whole notion of where Jesus would, would, would hang out, would he be at a place where sinners were? Um, did anything when you were reading the script or watching the episode, on what level of comfort were you or do you think some of the people of your tradition would be with Jesus showing up in a place where there's gambling taking place, in a place where maybe people were misusing wine? I mean, again, we don't, a lot of us don't drink wine at all, uh, but uh, there's clearly nothing scriptural that says you shouldn't drink wine at all, but maybe a place where a lot of, too much wine is drunk. Um, level of comfort that you think Catholics may feel with Jesus uh, being in a place like that? I think a lot of Catholics would be all right okay with it, <laughs> to tell the truth. Um, <laughs> like, oh good, we finally I mean, got I, I mean, affirmation. Well, thing, in, a, in a lot of Catholic countries, a, a, a bar or a pub is not a place of ill repute, but it's a gathering place. Right. So um, the way it's portrayed, I wondered about the historicity of, yeah, of a bar. I mean, I mean, I think that's probably an insertion. Yeah, I don't know that they would have had bars yeah. like that in the time of Jesus, I don't recall yeah. ever and I remember yeah. inns and things yeah. like that. Yeah. That probably caught my eye more than the idea right. that Jesus would be in a bar. But um, no, I th and I think if you look at the faith stories of some people and the stories I've heard people tell, especially in their struggles with addiction, I think they'd probably be pretty comforted that, that the idea that Jesus might come to get them in a bar. Right. Yeah, I think the broad evangelical tradition would uh, resonate with this. It's well known that Jesus right. went to places where people of ill repute were hanging out and he was not afraid of rubbing shoulders with them. Um, yeah, I don't know much about the first century bar scene. Um, yeah, we did a lot of research on it and it, was, it wasn't, it was there, there was nothing that told us it what couldn't have been. There's no evidence that there were bars traditionally, but there were places, we even saw some, some 
carvings and whatnot that represented places where people gathered and told stories and, and kind of hung out. And we yeah. thought, well, they, you know, it would make sense that they would drink wine together and yeah. whatnot. You yeah, said and, and there was no neon lights uh, in the movie right. uh, outside right. uh, flashing, and yeah, that was good. I, I think probably the biggest anachronism problem with episode one is um, the scene where the fishermen are fighting. Right. And he says, he gives him a liver punch and says this is wine hands. Oh, I mean, the, the ancients knew about uh, wine, of course, and uh, they, the ancients knew about livers, but I'm not so sure that they connected alcohol with uh, liver disease. Yeah, there's a scene where he, where he punches the guy and says, that's why they call me wine hands, yeah. because of what I do to your liver. Yeah. And a couple of people on the set said, would they have known that wine bothered the liver back then? I said, hey, nerd, uh, you don't need to point that out. No one's going to notice. And then you've noticed and a few other people have noticed. Uh, 1826 is the date I think I can put on that. Because <laughs> <So. laughs> uh, we thought, well, maybe they could have known that, like, because they, they did look at bodies, right, after death oh, at yeah, times. Yeah. They, they knew about the body parts. Yeah. Right, that livers, certain livers seemed worse than others and that maybe a guy had drank too much wine. But yeah, it's probably a, 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 a bad one. But it was just, it made for a good joke, because yeah. when his brother says, oh, that, uh, that was cheesy, wine yeah. hands, and he says, oh, that sounded more clever in my head. I th it was actually, that actually made it better when they teased each other about it later. Right, right. Well, because the joke itself is cheesy. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah, but when, he, when he makes fun of him for it. Yeah. All right, well, episode one, uh, we covered a lot of ground, and uh, what we're going to do after each of these episodes is just talk through kind of what, we went, what went right, what went wrong, uh, what was close, and how each of these uh, different faith traditions uh, may respond to it. Uh, but we hope you'll join us again for uh, after episode two.